Hi, this is Eric Anderson with another Profitable Insight. This is episode number six, and we're going to be reading today from The Effective Executive by Peter Drucker. The whole purpose of these podcasts is to help you to be a profitable leader, build a profitable business, and live a profitable life for the benefit of others and for the glory of God. So Peter Drucker is one of those thinkers who can put into words the things that you think about all the time but can't articulate. Another guy like that is someone like Dietrich Bonhoeffer. If you want to read a good book, read Life Together. That's just a little bonus there. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Life Together. But today we're going to be reading from The Effective Executive. And The Effective Executive is a classic uh, book for business leaders. It's got uh, seven chapters to it. Number one, effectiveness can be learned. Uh, Chapter 2 is Know Thy Time. Chapter 3, What Can I Contribute? Chapter 4, Making Strength Productive. Chapter 5, First Things First. Chapter 6, The Elements of a Decision Making. Chapter 7, Effective Decisions. And so what we're going to do is we're going to read from uh, Chapter 4 today on Making Strength Productive. Making Strength Productive. So I'm going to read an introductory paragraph, then we're going to grab a couple of other quotes. We're going to draw our nine practical lessons from this reading, and then you can take it and apply it in your life so that you can improve your leadership. Okay? So I'll read here. The effective executive makes strength productive. He knows that one cannot build on weakness. To achieve results, one has to use all the available strengths, the strengths of associates, the strengths of the superior, and one's own strengths. These strengths are true opportunities. To make strength productive is the unique purpose of organization. It cannot, of course, overcome the weaknesses with which each of us is abundantly endowed, but it can make them irrelevant. Its task is to use the strength of each man as a building block for joint performance. So some key thoughts there as far as that introductory paragraph. Okay, right here. To make strength productive is the unique purpose of organization. Okay, to make strength productive is the unique purpose of organization. So he goes on here in the chapter and he begins to use some illustrations. And we're going to um, we're going to read a little bit more from here. And the great thing about this is the history illustration. And I love history. So we're going to dive right into it. President Lincoln. This is a reference to President Lincoln during the Civil War. When told that General Grant, his new commander in chief, was fond of the bottle. Uh, Grant was often accused by people of being a drunk. Um, People think that's kind of a false accusation in some ways, but nevertheless, he had the reputation of being a drunk. Okay, so he was fond of the bottle, and this is what Lincoln said. If I knew his brand, I'd send a barrel or two to some other generals. After a childhood on the Kentucky and Illinois frontier, Lincoln assuredly knew all about the bottle and its dangers. But of all the Union generals, Grant alone had proven consistently capable of planning and leading winning campaigns. Grant's appointment was the turning point of the Civil War. It was an effective appointment because Lincoln chose his general for his tested ability to win battles and not for his sobriety, that is, for the absence of weakness. Lincoln learned this the hard way, however. Before he chose Grant, he had appointed in succession three or four generals whose main qualifications were their lack of major weaknesses. As a result, the North, despite its tremendous superiority in men and materiel, had not made any headway for three long years from 1861 to 1864. In sharp contrast, Lee, in command of the Confederate forces, had staffed from strength. Every one of Lee's generals, from Stonewall Jackson on, was a man of obvious and monumental weaknesses. But these failings Lee considered, rightly, to be irrelevant. Each of them had, however, one area of real strength. And it was this strength, and only this strength, that Lee utilized and made effective. As a result, the well-rounded men Lincoln had appointed were beaten time and again by Lee's single-purpose tools, the men of narrow but very great strength. So how many people do you know in an executive role, think about yourself, that have more than one or maybe even two real strengths? Effective executives are excellent at identifying not only the strengths that they have and then utilizing them, but identifying the strengths that others have and making sure those people are put in a position to use those strengths. Okay, so we're going to dive into a little more reading here. And we're going to use an illustration of 
General Marshall from World War II. So we just had Lincoln in the Civil War and General Marshall in World War II. The reason why these war analogies are so helpful, at least to me, is because of the necessity of war. War is a win or lose kind of thing, and it puts people in a position where they have to be effective if they're going to achieve the, um, the goal of the war, which is to win. It's the same thing in business, right? We're all in it to win. Now, winning may w mean one thing to you and another thing to another person, but I'd like to submit to you that winning in business is being profitable. And being profitable means making money and benefiting your customers, yourself, your clients, the people who work for you, the people who own the business. That's what it means to win. And I don't know about you, but I'm in business to win. I hope you're in business to win as well. So let's take a look at the rest of this, uh, this reading here. It is the duty of the executive to remove ruthlessly anyone, and especially any manager who consistently fails to perform with high distinction. To let such a man stay on corrupts the others. Notice the strong language that Drucker uses here. And the reason why I think this paragraph is absolutely important is because I cannot count the number of times I've chatted with clients and they're struggling with a particular person in a position in their organization. And I ask them, when are you going to remove this person? And, you know, they kind of shrug and say, you know, I should have done it six months ago. So I ask them again, well, if you haven't done it in 90 days, do I have your permission to yell at you? <laughs> this is one of the greatest challenges we have, right? We have people in positions that they shouldn't be in and we allow them to stay there. And as an effective executive, we do a disservice to ourselves and to the organization when we allow that to happen. So let me just continue reading here. It is grossly unfair to the whole organization. It is grossly unfair to his subordinates who are deprived by their superiors inadequacy of opportunities for achievement and recognition. Above all, it is senseless cruelty to the man himself. Have you ever thought about that? When you leave someone in a position they shouldn't be in, you're being senselessly cruel to them. Indeed, going back to the reading here, I have never seen anyone in a job for which he was inadequate, who was not slowly being destroyed by the pressure and the strains, and who did not secretly pray for deliverance. Now, onto this illustration of General Marshall. General Marshall during World War II insisted that a general officer be immediately relieved if found less than outstanding. To keep him in command, he reasoned, was incompatible with the responsibility the army and the nation owed the men under an officer's command. Think about the responsibility that you owe your employees who are under the leadership of an ineffective executive. Go back to the reading here. Marshall flatly refused to listen to the argument. Excuse me, I'll read that again. <laughs> Marshall flatly refused to listen to the argument, but we have no replacement. All that matters, he pointed out, is that you know that this man is not equal to the task. Where his replacement comes from is the next question. But Marshall also insisted that to relieve a man from command was less a judgment on the man than on the commander who had appointed him. Always remember that your company is a direct reflection of the quality of your leadership. You cannot escape that. You must take full responsibility for the quality of the leaders in your organization, because if you lead that organization, you're responsible for them being there. The only thing we know, back to the reading here, is that this spot was the wrong one for the man, he argued. This does not mean that he is not the ideal man for some other job. Appointing him was my mistake. Now it's up to me to find what he can do. And we know this happens in business all the time. The classic one, of course, is where you have the sales superstar who's just knocking it out of the park, killing it, making, you know, his, you know, exceeding all expectations. And the leader looks at that person and says, okay, he's going to be the sales manager now. And of course he sucks at sales managing because what made him an excellent salesperson makes him a terrible manager. He's just out there by himself, kicking butt. And when you put him in a place of responsibility, holding others accountable, it's just not him. Okay, so again, just because someone fails in a position doesn't mean you should necessarily fire them. They may need to be redeployed into another position where their strengths can be used. Your responsibility as the leader of the company is to find out what those strengths are. Okay, back to the reading here. Although General Marshall offers a good example of how one makes strength productive, the future generals of World War II were still junior officers with few hopes of promotion when Marshall began to select and train them. Eisenhower was one of the older ones, and even he in the mid-30s was only a major. Yet by 1942, Marshall had developed the largest and clearly the ablest group of general officers in American history. There was almost no failures in it and not many second raiders. 
This, one of the greatest educational feats in military history, was done by a man who lacked all the normal trappings of leadership, such as the personal magnetism or the towering self-confidence of a Montgomery or a de Gaulle or a MacArthur. Montgomery, de Gaulle, and MacArthur were all guys with massive egos who were successful to one extent or another, and Marshall was not like that, but he was not hindered by his lack of charisma, and this is why. Back to the reading. What Marshall had were principles. What can this man do was his constant question. And if a man could do something, his lacks became secondary. So think about that again. When you're looking at the people in your organization, don't lament what they can't do. Focus on what they can do. It is your responsibility as the leader to put them in a position to succeed, utilizing the strengths that they already possess. Back to the reading. Marshall, for instance, again and again, came to George Patton's rescue and made sure that this ambitious, vain, but powerful wartime commander would not be penalized for the absence of the qualities that make a good staff officer and a, success, excuse me, a successful career soldier in peacetime. Okay, Patton was a muddy boots general. He wasn't a staff officer to sit and play politics, you know, behind the lines. He was on the tank, leading his troops into battle, um, engaging with the enemy and winning the war in a very direct way. Um, uh, Marshall understood that and he made sure that Patton was put in those positions to, to utilize his great strength. Marshall was only concerned, back to the reading, with weaknesses when they limited the full development of a man's strength. These he tried to overcome through work and career opportunities. So this here shows the depth of Marshall's uh, mind, the breadth of it as well, in the sense that he could look at Patton and understand Muddy Boots General, get him on the front line, let him lead the troops. But then he had this guy Eisenhower, okay? And he understood that Eisenhower had particular strengths, but the weaknesses that he had would hinder him from using those strengths to their greatest capacity. So this is what he did. Back to the reading. The young Major Eisenhower, for instance, was quite deliberately put by Marshall into war planning in the mid-30s to help him acquire the systematic strategic understanding which he apparently lacked. Eisenhower did not himself become a strategist as a result, but he acquired respect for strategy and an understanding of its importance, and thereby removed a serious limitation on his great strength as a team builder and a tactical planner. So in order to use that strength of team building and tactical planning, Eisenhower at least had to have an appreciation for strategic planning. So Marshall put him in a position where he could learn that strategic planning and therefore contribute his strength of team building and tactical planning in a greater way. Back to the reading. Marshall always appointed the best qualified man, no matter how badly he was needed where he was. We owe this move to the job. We owe it to the man. And we owe it to the troops. Was his reply when someone, usually someone high up, pleaded with him not to pull out an indispensable man. A superior has responsibility for the work of others. He also has power over the career of others. Making strength productive is therefore much more than an essential of effectiveness. It is a moral imperative, a responsibility of authority and position. To focus on weakness is not only foolish, it is irresponsible. A superior owes it to his organization to make the strength of every one of his subordinates as productive as it can be. Okay, so let's pull away nine takeaways from this reading. Number one, to make strength productive is the unique purpose of an organization and a leader. Number two, the effective executive fills positions and promotes on the basis of what a person can do. Number three, staffing decisions are made to maximize strength, sometimes only one strength. Number four, it is the duty of the executive to remove ruthlessly anyone, especially a leader, who consistently fails to perform with high distinction. Number five, the effective executive takes personal responsibility for hiring failure. Number six, for the executive, principle-based leadership, in this case, the staffing on the basis of strength is more important than personal leadership charisma. So principles are more important than charisma. Again and again and again, principle is more important than charisma. 
Number seven, only concern yourself with a person's weaknesses when they limit the full development of their strengths. That goes back to the Eisenhower example. Number eight, use tours of duty in different departments and divisions to give the person a broader perspective and enable them to effectively use their strengths. And then number nine, in other words, take the long view in someone's career. Work hard to identify their strengths and think through how you can use their strengths for the long term. So I hope you enjoyed the reading from The Effective Executive by Peter Drucker. Go to Amazon, pick up a copy for yourself. It's only 10 bucks. It's awesome. I know you'll enjoy it. Share it with executives in your organization. If you have any questions, please send me an email, eric at ericanderton.com. Put in the subject line, Peter Drucker, Making Strengths Productive. And I will reply personally to your email. The whole purpose of these podcasts is to help you to be a profitable leader, build a profitable business, and live a profitable life for the benefit of others and for the glory of God. Thanks for taking time to check out this podcast. And again, my name is Eric Anderton. Contact me with any questions.